Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our first uh, Center for Historical Research uh, seminar for 2018. Today, we will have the pleasure of hearing from uh, Dr. Valentine Mogadam uh, from Northeastern University. He'll present on, is the, Fre is the future of revolution feminist? Uh, professor Mogadam is a uh, professor of sociology and international affairs and director of the Middle East Studies Program at Northeastern University. She's a former section chief at UNESCO and the author of Modernizing Women, Gender and Social Change in the Middle East, and Globalizing Women, Transnational Feminist Networks, winner of the American Political Science Association's Virginia Shuck Award, and other path-breaking works on women and revolution in the Middle East. I first became familiar with Professor Mogadam's work when she gave a, a talk at the Mershon Center, I think, I think it was 2010, 2011. Arab Spring was just beginning. She had a model in which she assessed which of the revolutions she thought had the best chance of success. She picked Tunisia and Morocco uh, on the basis of how robust their women's rights movements and women's political involvement was uh, and regime responsiveness to women's issues in the lead up to those revolutions. And, and her, her uh, predictions were stunningly accurate. That made me a follow of her work, uh, which is you know, voluminous, many, many, many uh, very important articles. and. Um, important books as well. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to what she has to say to us today about the notion of world revolution and the importance of women's rights and the women's movement in um, promoting democratization. Right. So thank you. Well, hello, everyone. And it's, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. This is my third visit to Ohio State University. And um, it really is nice to come back here. And thank you very much, Professor Newell, for the kind uh, invitation to this excellent um, uh, lecture series. Um, yes, um, you say you want a revolution. Well, we do want to change the world. Um, and I'm really delighted that uh, you know, there is this renewed interest in uh, scholarship on revolution, as well as um, perhaps some advocacy and ad activism around um, the kind of new and different world that we might want. So um, what I am uh, going to do today is um, to talk a little bit about my past work on gender and revolution, um, and also uh, tie it to the uh, work that I did also on women and democratic transitions. And then I want to introduce this concept of world revolution which comes from um, the world systems um, sort of theoretical framework. Um, and let's see how that goes. Um, this, uh, you know, this latter part of what I'll be presenting today is a little bit of a work in progress. And this is a paper that um, I am working on and still working through. So um, you're the first to hear it. And um, I really look forward to your comments and, and, and suggestions and questions. So. Oh, and by the way, um, the title, I've been playing around with the title of Feminism and the Future of Revolution, or Is the Future of Revolution Feminist, which by the way is a, a title of an already published paper of mine. But um, yeah, that's something that um, I'll be thinking about later on as well, um, is the title. So, Feminism, Revolution. In my earlier work on uh, gender and revolutions, I developed a model of gendered revolutionary processes and outcomes. First of all, does everyone, can everyone hear me properly? Yeah. Um, and in that model, um, I looked at how what I called, you know, bourgeois, socialist, and populist revolutions uh, were classified as either egalitarian, uh, which I called the woman's emancipation model, or patriarchal, which is the women in the family model of revolution. And I used this model to analyze the gender dynamics of, among others, um, the French Revolution of 1789, the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, the Iranian Revolution of 1979, and the East European Revolutions of 1989. In the new century, I revisited that model in light of the multifaceted processes of uh, globalization, um, in light of the end of the Cold War, the global spread of feminist discourses, and the emergence of women's movements and organizations across countries and regions. And just to give you an idea of you know, the different uh, literature that I'm drawing on for this bit of my talk, 
Um, I hypothesized um, at that time, and that's in that 23, uh, 2003 um, paper, that um, if any future revolution uh, or oppositional movement did not incorporate women and feminism, it would be to their disadvantage. Such movements, I argued, would be less likely to gain either national or international support. And I um, pointed to the widespread condemnation of the Taliban um, and their gender apartheid um, regime as an example. Um, I proposed also that revolutions would continue um, because neoliberal globalization, which was and remains the current stage of capitalism, was resulting in increased inequalities globally and within societies, as numerous publications, of course, have now documented, which I'm sure many of you in this audience know about those publications. Thomas Piketty is you know, one of the most um, recent ones, but I hope um, 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 uh, Milanovic is um, you know, very good at that as well. So, now, um, of course, as we all know, oppositional movements did emerge and they mobilized at both national and global levels, as we saw with the anti-globalization protests of uh, 1999 to 2001, as we saw also with the Latin American pink tide in the new uh, century, the formation of uh, the World Social Forum in uh, 2001, and um, the green protests in Iran in June of 2009, and in uh, 2011, the Arab Spring protests Occupy Wall Street and the anti-austerity movements and protests in Europe and also in Chile. So organization and mobilization was facilitated by uh, new civil society mobilizing structures and by um, the expanding global infrastructure created by transnational social movements that were associated with labor, women, human rights, uh, and the environment. Women and feminist organizations were strongly represented in that new global social movement infrastructure. And many of them had analyses, critiques, and demands that echoed the socialist feminist narratives of the early days of uh, second wave feminism. A spate of publications on um, uh, the uh, global justice movement, and I have some of those titles up there, um, on uh, the World Social Forum process and uh, the World Revolution of 20-something um, seemed to confirm my proposition that future revolutions would have features associated with both feminism and socialism. Well, I now want to explore that proposition further in light of the disappointing outcomes of um, the Arab Spring, the receding of the Latin American uh, pink tide, the waning away of uh, Occupy Wall Street, and the continued austerity measures in Europe, along with the rise of right-wing populist and nationalist movements, parties, and governments across the globe. So I want to make and propose um, the following propositions. That first, that um, the nature of revolution actually may be changing. The post-Cold War um, and neoliberal world order limits the opportunity structure for individual cases of successful revolutions. So we're no, no longer living in those days when you know, revolutionary movements could turn to, for example, the Soviet Union and the Socialist Bloc. Um, my second point is that the world revolution of 20-something, and I'll say more about that later, um, will not be successful unless women and their organizations are fully integrated at all levels, including the leadership. The third point is that feminists must fully integrate socioeconomic and class concerns in their agendas if they are to broaden their base and to weaken the base of right-wing populist movements. And finally, that uh, there needs to be an effective mechanism to coordinate the disparate mass protests across the globe. And the World Social Forum could become that mechanism if it changed its charter and also agreed to work with uh, progressive political parties and governments. 
So, um, these are some of the propositions that I want to explore today and then get back to um, at the end. So, back to gender and revolutions, before and after feminism and globalization. Now, my early work on gender and revolution was an attempt to bridge the divide between the feminist scholarship on women and revolutions and the more mainstream um, study of revolutions. In the feminist scholarship, women's roles in revolutions were recovered from historiographical obscurity and emphasized as important to the course and outcome of the revolutions. Still, many feminist scholars argued that revolutionary movements subordinated women's interest to the broader or basic revolutionary goals, and that revolutionary states often marginalized um, or excluded women from uh, power and enacted legislation that emphasized women's family roles. So that was a common theme in a lot of the feminist literature on, um, on the revolution. Um, in contrast, Mainstream studies of revolution had tended to neglect um, women and gender issues almost entirely. Their description and analyses of revolutionary causes and outcomes focused on class, state, and international conflicts as key factors. So what I tried to do in my work was to combine attention to um, structure that had been characteristic of what was known as the third uh, generation of scholarship on revolution, um, you know, uh, characterized by obviously Scotch Paul and Goldstone and folks like that, and then the more recent um, work on agency or culture that was said by Goldstone himself to be a part of the so-called fourth wave of, um, of uh, revolutionary studies or fourth generation. So my work on gender and revolution was thus an attempt to integrate gender analysis in the broader study of revolution and to differentiate revolutions by their gendered outcomes. It grew from the simple observation that almost all revolutions involve the participation of women in ways that disrupt pre-existing social relations of gender, and that revolutionary states are preoccupied with policies and laws pertaining to women in the family. In my review of the great social revolutions and various third world revolutions of the 20th century, I found two types of revolutions and their implications for uh, women and gender relations. And so I call these the women's emancipation model and the patriarchal model. So in the women's emancipation model, the social participation of women is a key revolutionary goal, um, and legal and policy reforms are enacted for women's um, equality and rights. So women are supposed to be part of the nation's productive forces, part of the citizenry, and um, they are to be emancipated to play a role in, obviously, the building of this new, modern, progressive so uh, society and state. So we have the new ideal man, but also the new ideal woman. Um, now, um, uh, and then, of course, we have the uh, patriarchal uh, model in which women are marginalized in the new states, the motherhood discourse prevails, and women are associated with uh, childbearing, with motherhood, with marriage, with culture, with religion. Now these are ideal types, um, you know, Bavarian sort of ideal types, um, and there have been in, you know, both cases differential effects upon women based on obviously social class, race, ethnicity, and also ideological divisions among women. Nevertheless, it seemed to me at the time, and I would argue it remains the case, that most revolutions um, historically have fallen into one or the other of these um, categories. Um, so we have a group of revolutions that have been sort of good for women and a group of revolutions that haven't been so great for women. And so I looked empirically at a number of different revolutions and then I classified them. Um, so we have our group of socialist populist revolutions and you know, the bourgeois uh, you know, democratic revolutions and so on. Um, so notice that in our um, sort of uh, the women's emancipation model, of course, it begins with Russia in 1917, which actually had an extraordinarily avant-garde, very, very forward-looking and uh, progressive uh, view on gender relations and the status of women um, in the society and in the new, you know, Soviet, you know, Russia, so to speak. Extraordinarily avant-garde for its time, and for a while it, uh, you know, it worked that way. Remember then uh, that my um, sort of theory of gender and revolution really focuses on the immediate outcomes, not the longer term outcomes.
not the you know, outcomes 20 or 30 years in. Um, and uh, so China, Cuba, Vietnam, democratic Yemen. Anyone heard of democratic Yemen? Which was, thank you, which was uh, regarded as the Cuba of the Middle East at yeah. one point with an extremely um, uh, progressive family law, for example. Democratic Afghanistan. Does every, anyone even know what democratic Afghanistan was? Um, that, thank you. <laughs> 1978, um, the, uh, the Saab Revolution of April 1978 and it fell apart in 1992, after which the Mujahideen came that had been supported by the United States, followed by the Taliban, followed by uh, what we have today, which is really very, uh, very sad. Um, Nicaragua, El Salvador, and then of course the Zapatistas. Um, and uh, with our bourgeois democratic revolutions, I sort of classified Kemalism in Turkey. Now, a more recent revolution, Tunisia, would definitely fall in that. Tunisia, of course, was uh, the, the one bright outcome uh, and the success story of the Arab Spring. And it was a revolution, a political revolution, not a social revolution quite like Iran's, but a political revolution, although initially it should have been a social revolution because what the, uh, the people and the revolutionary wanted was a radical social democracy. And that's what uh, also generated their protest last month because economically the country has really been suffering and it's you know, taken a different route. But in any event, in 2011, not only was women's presence quite visible in the actual protest, but feminists were there too, and feminists were protesting against the entry onto the political space of this Islamist movement called Enahda. And so the outcomes were very, very different because of the mobilization of the feminist organizations in coalition with their um, secular and progressive allies. Um, the woman, I want to say a little bit about the woman in the family model of revolution because it actually aligns rather nicely with uh, the emergence more recently of these right-wing populist and nationalist movements that we see in countries like Poland, Hungary, um, uh, India, <coughs> Turkey, uh, the Philippines, and so on and so forth. So the woman in the mat, uh, family model of revolution excludes women from definitions and constructions of independence, liberation, and liberty, <coughs> and sometimes expressly designates women as second-class citizens or legal minors. And it frequently constructs an ideological linkage between patriarchal values, nationalism, and the religious order. It assigns women the role of wife and mother and associates women not only with family but also with tradition, culture, and religion. Um, and of course, the historical precursor um, is, ironically, the French Revolution, which, despite its many, many progressive features, the droit de l'homme, human rights, the abolition of slavery, you know, all sorts of wonderful things, had a very, very poor um, outcome for, uh, for women. The French woman's chief responsibility in the Republic was biological reproduction and the sociological, uh, soci uh, so socialization of children in uh, Republican uh, virtues. And of course, Iran falls um, absolutely in, uh, in that category um, as well, as does uh, Mexico, Algeria. And, um, and, and a lot of the studies that were coming out in the early 1990s about the changes in Eastern Europe also seemed to confirm um, that those revolutions, too, fell in uh, the patriarchal model. Women lost out uh, economically and politically. Many of them lost their jobs, and many of them also in the first, ironically, in the first democratic revolutions, saw their uh, political representation in the political structures in the parliaments fall from an average of 30% to something like 5%. That changed later on, but again, the immediate outcome was not positive for women. So that was the early work on gender um, uh, outcomes of, of revolution. And um, then, you know, a couple of years later, some years later, I became in, uh, inspired by uh, Georgina Whalen's work, work on democratic uh, transitions and her, you know, book on um, engendering transitions. So I applied my model to the democratic transitions, and I think it works there too. Um, so note here that, um, you know, I have two separate slides, one on revolution and one on social movements. Later on, I'm going to interrogate this distinction. Uh, between social uh, movements and revolutions, and we'll try to you know come back come back to that um, 
as well. Um, so now, why are some of these countries uh, typed egalitarian and why patriarchal? Well, in the egalitarian cases, you see the uh, emergence of you know, well-resourced women's policy agent, agencies, women's entry into decision-making positions, laws on violence against women, um, and um, you know, the establishment of parliamentary um, quotas with an increase in uh, women's political representation. And that happened um, fairly quickly in um, Argentina, for example. Uh, by contrast, in Eastern Europe and, um, and Russia, you saw the declines in that high uh, communist era of parliamentary representation. Um, you know, we don't have to get into the question of you know, how influential and strong and powerful were those parliaments, um, but uh, still, you know, the presence of women in these structures and these institutions of formal politics, I think, was, did say something. Um, in most of these countries also, abortion rights were either um, restricted um, or uh, withdrawn. Today, again, we see in Poland, they're, you know, they've been having this uh, discussion again. Um, and the motherhood um, discourses prevail. Um, in Indonesia, Turkey, and Egypt are part of the patriarchal um, um, model of democratic transition, too. Now, Turkey is an interesting case because in the late 90s and into the new century, it appeared to be moving in a more emancipatory um, and egalitarian direction, um, especially in terms of some of the legal and policy changes with respect to women's rights, um, dialogue with the Kurds, um, human rights, um, and you know, interest in joining the EU, and so on and so forth. But this has changed, as we all know. Um, and so polygamy has been maintained in, for example, um, you know, Indonesia, also in Egypt. There are very weak policies on violence against women. There's Islamic value orientation, an encouragement of religiosity and motherhood. And that's something that is new to Turkey, in fact, um, in these past few years. And really no meaningful uh, female representation. And of course, an authoritarian polity that, um, uh, that um, uh, re-emerges, certainly in, in Turkey and, and Egypt. In, in Indonesia, what we're seeing is uh, a real deepening and, and intensification of um, Islamization. So what determines each type of revolution or a democratic transition and its gender outcomes? So here, ideology and social structure are equally salient. In general, where revolutionaries are guided by a modernizing and socialist ideology, and where women have had a strong presence, the outcome is more likely to be emancipatory in gender terms. Um, where revolutions or democratic transitions are guided predominantly by religious or nationalist ideology, patriarchal outcomes are more likely to, um, uh, to occur. Um, you know, during a democratic revolution, during, um, uh, during any kind of revolution, during mass protests, etc., where men and women are together on the squares, on the streets, and, and so on, there does tend to be a temporary uh, disruption of traditional gender relations, even in places that are typically sex-segregated. Um, but what happens afterwards, usually, in certain cases, is that the pre-existing gender relations then um, uh, you know, move into the, uh, the post-revolutionary or post-democratic um, transition at, uh, era. But this is less likely to happen when we have had a critical mass of women who have entered the public sphere in the pre-revolutionary situation and when large numbers of women have uh, take part in the revolution and assume uh, decision-making and leadership roles. And so as, you know, um, Professor Newell pointed out, you know, I had predicted in 2010 and 2011 that, you know, of those, um, you know, seven, the numbers vary, uh, but of those seven countries that were involved in and uh, or affected by the Arab Spring, really only Tunisia and Morocco were best placed to have a favorable outcome um, in a democratic direction and also in terms of women's rights precisely because of the pre-existing decades and long-standing 
um, mobilization, coalition building, and movement building of the feminist organizations at, in coalition with human rights organizations, trade unions in the case of Tunisia, and so on and so forth. This was not the case. These conditions were not present um, in Libya, um, uh, Syria, and Yemen, and they were not present in Egypt, even though so many people uh, got very excited about Egypt at the time, but um, Egypt did not have those conditions. I mean, all of these countries um, were authoritarian, after all. They all labored under, but there are varieties of authoritar authoritarianism as well. And even under authoritarian rule in Tunisia, also in uh, Morocco, but in Tunisia in particular, there was more room for maneuver for civil society and feminist organizations than was the case in Egypt, than was ever the case in Egypt. Um, so obviously, um, you know, things turned out differently in Egypt compared with uh, Tunisia. So structural determinants of gendered revolutionary outcomes and transitions seem to be first the pre um, uh, pre-existing social structure and the nature of gender relations, secondly, the movement ideology and goals, and thirdly, the extent of women's participation in the movement and the leadership. Now, I want to take a minute to apply this model to the Iranian Revolution of 1979. A great deal has been written on the subject, um, um, but I think it's well worth you know, going over it again. The Iranian Revolution of 1979 was probably the last of our social revolutions, you know, uh, what, uh, what uh, Scotch Paul has uh, defined as, you know, the great social revolutions um, of our modern era. Uh, the immediate gender outcome of the Iranian Revolution was a patriarchal and regressive one, in part due to the pre-existing social structure and the nature of gender relations. In the 1970s, Iran was a modernizing society, but a very dualistic one, characterized by a growing modern middle class and working class, alongside the older, more traditional, and um, uh, larger urban petit bourgeoisie and uh, rural populations. The modernizing efforts of the Pahlavi state had increased women's access to education, employment, and political participation, but these social changes and the legal reforms, such as a reform in the family law that accompanied them affected a relatively, actually a very small um, proportion of the female population. Uh, plus, such women, like myself, um, who entered public space, um, as well as the public, um, you know, public sphere to some extent, um, encountered some serious forms of sexual harassment. Now, the growing physical and social presence of urban women um, dismayed and disrupted a lot of men, and was eventually met by a backlash in the form of an Islamist movement that went on to overturn the Pahlavi era legal reforms, institute gender discriminatory policies, um, um, institute sex segregation, and emphasize women's maternal roles. Opposition to the new gender regime was limited, um, but it did occur, uh, emanating mainly from women leftists and liberals of the small urban upper middle class. And just to remind some of you of what that looked like, um, this was the rally for women's rights in March of 1979. So the protest really began, I mean, we periodized the Iranian revolution in some different ways, and some people say that it started actually in the fall with these poetry readings in 1977. Certainly 1978, especially in the fall of 1978, there were mass street demonstrations. Women took part in them to some degree. A lot of the women put on the veil to show their opposition to the Shah's modernizing you know, efforts, etc. These women really were not out on the streets as much. Not until March, uh, not until the so-called victory of the revolution, and not until Khomeini had decreed that he preferred to see women in hijab. So they came out in force on uh, International Women's Day and said, uh, we don't think so. Um, so this is another one of those, um, I mean, it was quite a, and here you see some um, of those valiant left-wing men who are uh, defending, um, you know, the women as well, um, and that was kind of necessary, considering that, you know, you had these Islamist thugs who were going around and really beating up on uh, women and, uh, and leftists. Um, 
you recognize that uh, picture, uh, Margaret? <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that's from the Bolshevik era. <laughs> um, so these were um, the, uh, the female stormtroopers, uh, dare I say, of, uh, <laughs> of, the, um, <laughs> of the, uh, the Islamic Republic. Um, and this uh, photo, I think, is great because, of course, this is uh, you know March 1979. But the one on the right is the June um, uh, Green protests, and they have taken the picture of that gal um, who was in um, uh, in the March 79 uh, protest, and they've uh, reproduced it in the form of a leaflet and a flyer. So they find her. They they found those women who were very uh, inspiring. Um, so, you know, why did things turn out that way? Well, uh, a major determinant was obviously, um, you know, the ideology of the revolutionaries. Um, you know, although left-wing organizations and movements were part of the anti-Shah revolutionary coalition, um, and in the early days of the post-revolutionary period, they did appear uh, popular and influential, the Islamic revolutionaries actually had a much larger base of support and they became the dominant force and went on to build the Islamic State. And theirs was a religious and cultural nationalist ideology that called for the re-establishment of the traditional Muslim family and codified a patriarchal gender contract premised upon the male breadwinner and female homemaker ideal. Although women had taken part in the massive street demonstrations of 78 and early 79, their slogans had been those of the broader revolutionary coalition and not those that might be more typical of women's interests, like you know, equality of women and men and so on. Not until March. Not until uh, March of 79. Um, now, many Iranian feminists have raised the question of why the left forces were kind of weak, vague, ambivalent on the woman question after the revolution. Um, and some have actually suggested that the left forces were hostile to feminism. I've actually taken this on and rejected it. I have an old article in New Left Review um, where I kind of defend the uh, uh, record of the Iranian left at that time in general. But uh, what I want to do now is to um, emphasize the social structural context in which this was occurring. Um, there was this, first of all, second wave feminism was very new. I mean, it was new in America. And already in America, there was you know, a counter-revolution to it. There was a counter-movement to it. And in the third world, it was even, even newer. Uh, so the novelty of feminism was something. And also at the time, um, there were different strands of feminism. There, were, uh, there was a lot of contestation around what, uh, uh, you know, what was appropriate for a country like Iran, what was appropriate for a third world country. So distinctions were being made between, for example, socialist feminists, Marxist feminism, radical feminism, you know, etc., and then also between Western feminism versus third world feminism. So that was still happening in the 1970s. In fact, it continued um, into the 1980s when the discourse and those arguments around what really constitutes uh, genuine feminism changed. By the way, we're coming back to those arguments. In fact, uh, later on. <laughs> um, so, and of course, it also had to do with just, you know, demography, you know, the very um, much larger representation of men in all kinds of institutions and in the street protests themselves. Um, of course, as I said, there were left-wing organizations, there were a lot of women in the left-wing organizations, there were some um, notable um, you know, fallen communist women and guerrillas who everybody had heard of and so on and so forth, but these were very, very small in, in number. Um, I think most, probably most importantly, um, there was no organizing of Iranian working class women. Whereas in the Bolshevik Revolution, um, the Bolsheviks, um, and especially Alexandra Kolontai, had been organizing women workers from 1905. Okay, now that was Iran in 1979. What a difference 30 years make. Tunisia. 2011, completely different outcome because the social structural conditions are different, pre-existing gender relations are different, um, the role of women in the movement um, and the institutions are very, very different. And of course, you had um, 30 years 
of very strong, mobilized, very vocal, very visible feminist organizations, especially the two big, Femme Democrate and Actour. Okay. Now, globalization. The era of globalization provides a systemic context that is both challenging and more conducive to women's participation in revolutionary uprisings. Let's begin with the enabling features. So, worldwide, a critical mass of activist women and women's organizations, as well as the diffusion of women's rights discourses, have changed the social relations of gender within societies and globally. Global feminism has emerged since at least 1985, when the UN's Third World Conference on Women to, took place in Nairobi, and a number of influential transnational feminist networks were formed. It has expanded since 1995, when the UN's Fourth World Conference on Women in Beijing resulted in the adoption of a platform for action and commitments by um, governments to implement its recommendations for women's equality, empowerment, and human rights. Women's caucuses were very active throughout the 1990s in all of those UN conferences. Rio in 92, Population and Development in 94, um, Human Rights in 93, and the Social Summit in um, March of 95 in Copenhagen. So as such, and this is why I say that you know, the, um, the women's movements and the transnational feminist networks that form contributed uh, significantly to this global infrastructure or what Mary Caldor has called global civil society. So that's why I argued in 2003 that with feminism's global diffusion, revolutionary movements and state building projects of the new century were more likely to incorporate women and feminism. And that those movements and opposition uh, uh, movements, opposition movements, revolutions, etc., that did not incorporate women or feminist ideals and goals were less likely to garner um, um, international support. Okay? But, challenges. There are challenges that are faced by feminism and um, revolution alike. Um, and these are formidable. Feminism may have been diffused transnationally during the era of globalization. And that's the um, sort of paradox, that um, feminism has grown and expanded exponentially around the world during the era of neoliberal globalization. That's one of those um, paradoxes. Um, but what has also happened is that the entrenchment of neoliberal capitalism has had several pernicious effects, of which I'll discuss two. First, it has co-opted certain strands of feminism in a so-called business or market-friendly direction, comfortable with capitalist globalization, engaged with national and international elites, and devoid of the transformative vision that was characteristic of both the early years of second wave feminism and also the early years of the transnational feminist networks that I wrote about that emerged in um, uh, the uh, mid-1980s. Um, in the absence of the transformation of an economic system wherein financial capital flows and all those weird exotic financial products are bought and sold with little to no oversight, leading in part to gross income inequalities, policies, uh, gross income inequalities, um, not to mention um, the Great Recession of 2008, um, Policies such as microcredits for poor women or increasing the number of women on corporate boards can be easily adopted and um, uh, absorbed without undermining the logic of neoliberal capitalist globalization. Similarly, um, calls for the integration of women and LGBT in the military actually reinforce militarism and military spending rather than interrogating it. And there's um, some interesting research that really finds um, 
um, strong correlation between the level of military spending and the extent and level of income inequality, and also shows a uh, negative correlation between military spending and, of course, social spending. Um, so this is, uh, uh, this is something that uh, you know, we can be thinking about. Um, secondly, this other challenge um, is that through its tendency towards a kind of oligarchy, Neoliberalism has uh, marginalized and alienated sections of the working class and lower income population that have now turned to right-wing anti-feminist, populist, and nationalist movements in various countries across the globe. Now, if you'll remember, back in the 1990s, who was anti-globalization? Leftists and feminists. Now, who's against globalization? It's, you know, who's joined that chorus? are uh, right-wingers, uh, populists and nationalists, protectionists, and so on and so forth. Um, so there's Marine Le Pen in France, um, you know, supposedly Donald Trump, although it's not clear where he stands, but certainly you know, Steve um, Bannon. Um, popular discontent uh, with the status quo has led, in some cases, to left-wing successes, such as Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Mark, uh, Labour um, a party in the UK, Pablo Iglesias and Podemos in Spain, and the Bloco de Esquerda in uh, uh, Portugal, which has you know, this feminist leadership, which is very interesting. But these have not been typical of recent electoral victories, which have been won largely by conservative and mainstream parties. And uh, worse, um, uh, right-wing populist parties or politicians have been elected or re-elected in the US, Turkey, Poland, Hungary, India, Finland, Germany, Holland, and Austria. Finally, not only did the Arab Spring yield a modest harvest in terms of a democratic outcome in Tunisia and constitutional reforms in Morocco, but paradoxically, again, more paradoxes, democracy and the opening up of political space has enabled the um, entry of very conservative um, Islamist parties into the political scene, which are now causing some trouble for um, the feminist organizations in these countries. Um, I don't think they can go very far, but you know, they are there. Um, although many observers, myself included, saw much pro uh, promise in the global justice movement and the 2011 mass protests, those events did not succeed in effecting lasting change. Despite what initially appeared to be cracks in the viability of the capitalist world system and conditions propitious for major uh, transformations, the disparate mass mobilizations were not able to undermine the neoliberal global order. Nor were the powerful poor countries willing to allow the Arab Spring protests to run their course organically and without um, external interference. So the so-called revolutions in Libya, Syria, and Yemen um, descended into violent, internationalized um, armed conflict. Moreover, the one Arab country that has peacefully overthrown its government and sought to establish a viable social democracy, Tunisia, has struggled economically ever since. I mean, in May of 2011, um, at a, uh, a conference in Deauville, France, the uh, European countries promised $40 billion to help um, Tunisia and Egypt on uh, uh, their road to uh, consolidation of their democratic transition. Only $7 billion of that has come to Tunisia, and more recently Tunisia has had to turn to the International Monetary Fund for um, a, a loan, a $2.8 billion loan, for which, in return to which, it has had to institute some austerity measures which then generated the protests uh, last month. And um, the uh, presence of two World Social Forum convergences in Tunis in 2013 and 2015 were not enough, unfortunately, to um, mobilize global support for that you know, rather beleaguered country. Um, the fate of the once radical Syriza party in Greece is further testament to the power and um, entrenchment of the neoliberal world order. So, in such a context, what is the future of feminist revolution? So let's go back just to remind ourselves of this, these revolutions in historical perspective, just 
our democratic revolutions of the 18th and 19th century, the socialist uprisings, the third world uh, revolutions. Um, and I'm going to be talking about the world, the so-called world revolutions. World system scholars have introduced the concept of world revolution, which are acts of resistance that are not necessarily coordinated, but that occur relatively close to one another in time. In their book, Anti-Systemic Movements, Ariki Hopkins and Wallerstein described how the world revolutions of 1848 and 1968 may have failed, as they said, quote, the bubble of popular enthusiasm and radical innovations was burst within a relatively short period, unquote. But they said that those two revolutions, even though they failed for their time, they actually did transform the world. The 1848 revolution institutionalized what later came to be known as the old left, um, and was a dress rehearsal for the Paris Commune, and also for the 1917 Bolshevik Revolution. Um, the year 1968, they argued, institutionalized what later came to be known as new social movements. Um, but Ariki, Hopkins, and Wallerstein left open the question of what it prefigured, what those, what 1968 prefigured, you know, moving forward. While acknowledging the new social movement's priorities and identities, and they included in their list of these, um, you know, new identity uh, movements, gender, generation, ethnicity, race, disability, sexuality, they asserted it, I'm quoting again, that the contradiction between labor and capital, given both the increasing central centralization of capital and the increasing marginalization of large sectors of the labor force, will remain elemental. Indeed, it has. Um, now, Terry Boswell, the late Terry Boswell, and, and Chris Chase Dunn, in their book, uh, The Spiral of Capitalism and Socialism, they continued um, that analysis that began, to, um, that Hopkins, um, Ariki and Wallerstein had started, and they distinguish, first they distinguish social revolution from world revolution. Social revolution, they say, you know, like the Iranian revolution, are class-based rapid transformation projects that build or strengthen states. Scotch Paul has talked about that too, Tilly has talked about that, and so on. By contrast, world revolutions are clusters of revolutionary activities and social movements. So now that fine distinction, that fine line between revolution and social movements is now beginning to be blurred a little bit. And they include, of course, separatist and colonial revolution in that cluster of you know, revolutionary activity that could form part of you know, uh, world revolution. Um, as with the um, analysis by Arigi, Hopkins, and Wallerstein, this is an expanded definition of revolution, not as a singular episodic event, but as a cyclical process. It's a different way of looking at revolution. As noted, neoliberal capitalist globalization has led to much dis, uh, dissatisfaction and unrest. But who will spearhead world revolution in our present era? Or what Chase Dunn and his colleagues call the world revolution of 20-something. Boswell and Chase Dunn note that, quote, despite globalization, international political parties and labor unions have not been among those international organizations on the rise. Now, this they said in the late 80s, the book came out in, uh, 90s, the book came out in 2000. Um, what they conclude is that, quote, a cluster of revolts in the semi-periphery, now remember, according to world systems theory, the semi-periphery is the weak link um, in the, uh, the world system. Um, a cluster of revolts in that semi-periphery, when matched with demands from core social movements, um, could, and also in peripheral uh, states, could suddenly make debated issues of global standards and developments an obvious um, solution. This would, in retrospect, appear to be a world revolution, one that would initiate new movements for global change. And in other writings, Chase Dunn has pointed out that instead of the so, sort of violent revolutions or coups that predominated in the past, the new global left movements, and I'll tell you what he means by global left in a moment, have preferred peaceful protests and the ballot box. Thus, that once 
firm distinction between revolution and social movements is replaced by an examination of anti-systemic activity within global civil society, and especially by that new global left, which is defined as that subgroup that is critical of neoliberal and capitalist globalization, and which includes popular forces, social movements, uh, global uh, political parties, and progressive national regimes. Just in case there's any question about it, it certainly does not include uh, Boko Haram, ISIS, um, you know, uh, oppositional um, you know, groups like that. Um, and analyzing the participants of the World Social Movement, uh, the World Social Forum, and the U.S. Social Forum between 2005 and 2010, Chase Dunn and his colleagues found strong movement linkages. For example, across the feminist, human rights, fair trade, health, environmental, peace, labor, etc., groups that take part in the uh, World Social Forum, but that all of them have one common concern uh, in particular, and that is climate change. So that could become the basis for some kind of concerted effort um, on the part of all of these disparate um, you know, movements. Now, in adopting the world system's perspective of world revolution as a cluster of revolts with progressive aims, the scholar can then situate the events of 2011, in other words, rather than being despondent about the waning away of everything in 2011, which, you know, frankly, I was for a while, um, we can situate the events of 2011 in, the in, in fact, the anti-globalization protest that took place some years earlier, a decade earlier. Um, we can recall the green protests of Iran in June of 2009, um, and of course in early 2018. We could consider um, the plight and potential of what Guy Standing has called the precariat, and we might also note that many trade unions around the world, and this is, you know, a sort of uh, little criticism of Chase Dunn and Boswell and their comment uh, in the year 2000, many trade unions around the world, certainly the one in Morocco, uh, in Tunisia, the UGTT, and a couple of the, you know, five major um, uh, trade unions in Morocco as well, are resolutely anti-neoliberal, as are many of the progressive political parties across the globe. So the global justice movement and the 2011 uh, revol uh, revolts um, could be seen as promoting a certain kind of global Keynesianism with redistribution of wealth and meaningful employment for all, and they were against authoritarianism and for genuine democracy, social rights, and dignity. The precariat that educated young people who can look forward, sadly, not to steady jobs with good wages and benefits, but um, underemployment and short-term jobs in what some euphemistically call the gig economy, they have taken part in many of these uh, movements and may become a major force in future anti-systemic revolts. But let's not forget the following observations. That first, the precariat includes many educated young women who are unemployed or lack a steady job, and in many countries, female youth employment, unemployment can be as high as 20 to 30 percent. Oftentimes, this notion of the precariat is cast in male terms. But many young women are part of the precariat, and actually in most countries, uh, women's unemployment is higher. The other major point that I want to return to is something that I said at the very beginning, one of my propositions, that in the post-Cold War, entrenched neoliberal world order, the nature of revolution may be changing. Um, and it limits the possibility for the singular, one-off, episodic uh, uh, revolutions. Um, going back to women, uh, women were visible in an almost unprecedented way in all of the 2011 revolts, as well as in the 2009 brief protests in Iran, and again, sustained feminist activism in Tunisia between 2011 and 2014 was responsible for the retention of key legal gains and the adoption of pro-feminist constitutional articles. Um, let me just uh, show you 
Oh, there we go. La révolution est toujours en route. This one, okay, let's go to. And this one, touche pas mes acquis. Don't touch the gains that we have already had over the years. So um, this is the kind of mobilization during the uh, protests in uh, Tunisia, um, which uh, blocked the Salafist and Islamist um, attempts to um, you know, uh, backtrack and roll back the gains that uh, had, uh, had been made under authoritarian rule, actually. Um, okay, women's organizations have helped to build civil societies and social movements nationally and globally. Feminist organizations exist in almost every country. Transnational feminist networks and women's NGOs coordinate activities. Women's peace groups, such as Code Pink and the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, take strong positions against militarism, war, environmental degradation, and all forms of violence against women. Um, feminists from various countries, as well as groups such as Match Mondial des Femmes and the World March of Women, are vocal and visible at all the world social forum convergences and have issued radical critiques and alternative visions. And the Global Women's March of 2017 and the marches of this year, this January, um, along with the Me Too and Time's Up campaign, may signal a new era of concerted feminist activism. So in contrast to the social revolutions discussed earlier, today's singular revolutionary movements face serious obstacles. For example, some like the FARC in Colombia have had to give up their arms and promise to take part in the electoral process, fully aware of their inability to have transformed Colombia's class relations, which was their initial goal. Others, such as Turkey's PKK and Syria's YPG, lack sufficient international support needed for the attainment of autonomy. Actually, what they've been banking on is the support of certain states. A bit of a mistake. Uh, the Palestinian Revolution has lost the political capital it enjoyed in the 1970s and 1980s, although widespread sympathy for the plight of the Palestinian people continues. So um, what these examples suggest, to me at least, is that nationally or regionally based revolutionary movements need to cultivate the support of progressive organizations, parties, and movements, such as those involved in the World Social Forum, rather than either depend on the support of some outside state, uh, such as you know, the YPG was you know, banking on the support of the United States, and most recently the United States has turned against the YPG. Um, or, you know, assume an exclusively militaristic stance. And those movements that do not integrate women and feminist concerns will have to do so if they are to garner the support of the world's women. At least the YPG does integrate and define itself as a feminist organization. Um, but I think the strategic mistake was um, hoping for um, sustained support on the part of the United States. So, if past revolutions and even many of the older social movements were dominated by men, today's social realities, including the presence of women across um, professions and occupations, their involvement in all manner of movements, organizations, networks, and political parties, and their leadership and creativity in their own organizations, movements, and networks, all of this means that women will be key players in any future revolution. Indeed, just as the Tunisian revolution succeeded in part because of the concerted efforts of women, feminists, and their allies, in contrast to the other failed cases. Um, the world revolution of 20-something can only succeed with the full integration of women, their organizations, and their concerns and demands. But if the feminist world revolution is But if the world revolution, a feminist world revolution is to uh, succeed, feminists themselves must fully integrate socioeconomic and class concerns in their agenda. This is crucial, in my view, in order to mobilize as broad a base, a female base, as possible for the new vision and policies that oppose patriarchy, militarism and war, and the economic injustices that afflict working class and poor women. 
from the lack of decent jobs, paid maternity and public transport, to the high cost of schools, housing, um, and health care. It is also necessary for today's regenerated, uh, reinvigorated feminism to include socioeconomic and class issues um, if uh, we are to undermine the social base of support for right-wing populists and nationalist feminists who have somehow uh, appropriated some of that language and um, um, attracted uh, people from that, uh, those social groups. Feminism should not cede the concerns of working class women or even women with religious values to the right wing. Valorization of motherhood through institutional supports for maternal employment and guaranteed health care for mothers and children is one way to start building bridges. And condemnation of all forms of violence against women, including domestic violence in the workplace, sexual harassment and abuse, should continue as that problem is a problem shared across cultures and classes. So, if one considers the many causes and revolts that make up our world revolution, protests against dictatorships and pro-democracy movements, criticisms of globalization and austerity, Black Lives Matter and the Dreamers campaign in the U.S., women's rights activists, the environmental movement and concerns over climate change, anger over corporate uh, power abuse and lack of uh, accountability. All of these disparate causes, movements, and revolts require a coordinating mechanism if they are to be effective and bring about lasting change. At present, there is one forum um, at which such issues are discussed, and it doesn't take place in Davos. <laughs> <laughs> Although the World Social Forum Charter expressly forbids the formulation of a political program or even working with progressive political parties, and, as Chase Dunn has noted, um, given his surveys of you know, folks who attend these, that a significant group of participants at the World Social Forum supports maintaining the forum as an open space for debate and organizing. Others, including myself, have called for a more concerted political orientation, including a kind of global united front and a more explicit political manifesto. Like other recent movements, notably the Occupy movement, the World Social Forum to date has been characterized by horizontalism, which uh, rejects traditional um, hierarchical structures and formal political organizations, and it prefers direct face-to-face -face democratic deliberation. That's great, but it's not sufficient. A return to more formal organizing structure with clear political goals and a unified strategy to achieve those goals through coalitions with like-minded political parties across the globe could very well pose a challenge to the current global system and in a way that does not enable it to be captured by the extreme right. So let me end in agreement with a pertinent prediction by Emmanuel Wallerstein. Quote, the modern world system is in structural crisis and has entered into a period of chaotic behavior which will cause a systemic bifurcation and a transition to a new structure whose nature is as yet undetermined and, in principle, impossible to predetermine, but one that is open to human intervention and creativity. And I would only add that women's intervention and creativity will be central to the making of the world revolution that will usher in, finally, a new and more just world order. Thanks. Well, thanks for that very thought-provoking talk. Um, and Professor Bobadon has agreed to take questions, so I have the mic. Do you have any questions out there? Thank you. And Professor Mogadon, thank you so much for such a wonderful talk. It was incredibly informative and also accessible. I really I was impressed. So I wanted to just touch on um, some of the threads that I felt. Uh, you know, feminist economists, economists have taught us the importance of looking at the ways structural adjustment policies depend on, in these invisible ways, uh, leveraging labor towards women in the household and the family. And I just wanted to ask you, what do we see possibilities for 
transnational labor organizing, which obviously would be so important for many of the ways that women are affected by these unemployment rates globally and the, and the structural adjustment policies. What have we been seeing in the last decade in terms of transnational labor organizing, and particularly through women's activities? In a word, not enough. Um, and, um, you know, when I wrote um, Globalizing Women, um, Transnational Feminist Networks, in 2005, and then I, used, um, you know, I sort of uh, returned to um, Transnational Feminist Networks in another book called uh, Globalization and Social Movement, Islamist and Feminism, the Global Justice Movement, um, I, um, I suggested that a really formidable alliance would be that between transnational feminist networks with their concern for um, the exploitation, well, either the marginalization of women from um, you know, valorized um, work or the exploitation and underappreciation of the work that they do. Um, so the, uh, a, a coalition and an alliance actually between transnational feminist networks and women's movements in different countries that have been appalled by the way um, uh, women's labor has been treated and unions. Um, and, um, uh, and I worked around this uh, a little bit with uh, someone who used to be here, uh, Mary Margaret Funham, um, and, um, and also uh, Suzanne Fransway. And we had a series of, of meetings and such, and then you know, put a book together called Making Globalization Work for Women, mm -hmm. the Role of um, Social Rights and Trade Union Leadership. Um, and we invited <coughs> feminist trade, union, uh, trade unionists from uh, various of the big uh, you know, global union federations and some national federations too. Um, their heart is in the right place, but all of them complain that uh, you know unions still have a long way to go to really integrate um, you know feminist issues and concerns. Um, I just finished another paper on Tunisia um, in which um, you know. Uh, I've interviewed some real stalwart feminist trade unionists who will not leave the UGTT because they feel that it is such an important um, actor against you know, uh, state policies and neoliberalism, um, but they themselves are feminists and they are very, very upset uh, by this very slow, far too slow and too gradual um, uh, integration of both women in leadership positions and feminist concerns in, on the agenda. But they will remain there because you know, just trade unions are just important act institutional actors. So um, I haven't seen um, you know, a great deal of, um, of that kind of collaborative effort uh, between you know, feminist organizations and trade unions. Thank you so much. Fortunately. Um, so I was really, I find your idea about having this global feminist political um, platform really intriguing. Um, but my concern is about the trade-off between having this inclusive platform um, that would enable mass globalization um, and possibly having a relatively depoliticized uh, platform that comes, um, you know, comes at a cost of getting more people on the streets and more visible. And I'm thinking about, for example, the Women's March um, last year and this year which had a relatively depoliticized platform of, you know, go, go to the polls and vote, no matter who you're voting for, just vote, versus the political platforms of Black Lives Matter, I Will No More, um, Standing Rock. Um, so can you maybe talk to those tensions um, yeah. and how you see that playing out? Yeah, and the Moral Mondays of uh, Reverend Barber, of course. Uh -huh. That would be a really interesting um, alliance um, as well. And I think that there are some women's organizations that are, um, you know, are beginning to work with, um, with Reverend Barber. Um, that's much more promising. I agree with you, um, Azita, that uh, you know the uh, the global march last year. I mean, I was there. I, I was there last month as well. I was one of the speakers, etc. I mean, it's you know there's something very inspiring about all these you know women coming out, you know, mass protests, etc. But you know, as I have pointed out, that mass protests by themselves are not sufficient. You know, I mean, it really does depend on you know what is the mobilizing ideology, the frames, the goals. Um, and you know what are the objectives? Um, and you know this is where um, some of these more recent critiques, um, you know, of uh, uh, you know of feminism come in. And you know they have resonated with me, and I've I've sort of agreed with them as well. Um, I mean, we were talking last night about how you know at the early part of this century, when I was able to meet with, let's say, even Iranian feminists, and I was asking them, you know, what are you doing to try to mobilize? 
um, you know, some of those um, uh, lower income, working class women who either are exploited in these awful private sector jobs or they're not able to find jobs at all, you know. And they weren't doing anything, you know. It, it, it was, uh, you know, they looked at me blankly as if, you know, they hadn't really thought about it. Um, so I think that that's beginning to change. Um, and I think that the protests last month were, were a wake-up call to a lot of these kinds of middle-class um, social movements that, um, you know, we have to start taking into account, you know, these sorts of issues. Um, so yes, I agree with you that, um, that to a certain extent, feminism has lost its way. There's a huge literature on this subject now. I don't know if some of you here have, I mean, I'm sure there are people from WGSS here, and uh, you know, you're probably familiar with the writings of folks like you know, Hester Eisenstein, and Nancy Fraser, and Angela uh, 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 Robbins, and Mick Roberts, and, and folks like that, um, who have been criticizing um, you know, what they call the liberal feminism, market feminism, business feminism, uh, neoliberal feminism, um, imperial feminism, um, and, uh, you know, uh, what can I say? They would not say go out and vote for anybody, um, and, uh, and so on. So um, that's why I have this call <laughs> to, you know, for a more reinvigorated feminism that is more expansive, and it's more expansive in class terms. And class terms also would integrate the issues and concerns of uh, many women of color as well, whether these are Muslim women or black women or Latino women. I think that that could be a common language um, that, uh, you know, that could bring us together. Yeah. Um, and that was something that was lost, I believe, also, if I may say so, uh, with intersectionality. Because I think the emphasis on intersectionality really was gender and race and ethnicity. But class got sidelined a little bit. You don't agree. <laughs> <laughs> campaigns and some of the older so, uh, you know, social movements and campaigns as well. 
All those folks, for example, who you know we would find at uh, the World Social Forum. Who has been to the World Social Forum in this, in this room? Okay, no one has been to the World Social Forum. Anyone to the U.S. Social Forum? Okay. All right. So um, a lot of really interesting groups, numerous groups. I mean, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of people converge on the World Social Forum, and they come from all parts of the world. Um, so that's what I mean by you know a kind of a more coordinated effort. Um, and a coordinated mechanism to bring together, to connect in a little bit more of a strategic manner um, those groups that come to the World Social Forum, but also Reverend Barber and uh, um, Black Lives Matter, etc., with some of these new, vibrant, and very, very interesting uh, new political parties. That's what I really meant. But you want to continue. Well, it just seems as if. Um, some of the core organizing principles of those newer campaigns or new, newer social movements. There is this resistance to a kind of fixed status for their issues, a fixed status around, you talked a bit about, about shifting leadership. So those kinds of components seem antithetical to this idea of coming together. And I'm very sensitive, <coughs> um, as a person who studies institutions, I'm very sympathetic to this idea of can we establish some type of institutional space. But it just seems as if the levels of political trust and interest and the ways in which those new social movements or new campaigns have formulated and built their bases is completely um, in contest to any kind of fixed status. I mean, it, it varies from country to country. Okay. Um, you know, uh, in, in the United States, it's very established. I mean, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party are very, very established. I mean, who, you know, who do we have as alternatives? We've got Bernie Sanders trying to establish, you know, our revolution. Um, and, uh, you know, you've got, uh, you know, Jill Stein and, you know, the Green Party. I mean, we have to, you know, we have to wait and see what comes out of these alternative uh, political party initiatives. Um, you know, will they be able to, will their message resonate broadly? Will they be able to appeal to and attract and recruit, you know, more Americans away from, you know, some of these mainstream parties? Um, will they be able to revive um, the trust and confidence in uh, political parties, in genuine political parties that genuinely go after um, and represent their interests and not, you know, someone else's interests, you know, whether it's, you know, the person who funded your campaign um, or, you know, um, so, uh, you know, we have to wait and see how that plays itself out. But in some countries, in Portugal, for example, in Spain, for example, these new parties have not done badly. Have not done badly at all. Um, so, and of course, you know, as I said, in, in the UK, I mean, Momentum. Momentum, Corbyn was being written out uh, by the press and almost every single article. That, I mean, I remember so clearly when I was in the UK, my husband was in London, so I go there a lot, and I remember so clearly, even the Guardian Weekly, which I subscribe to, you know, wrote it off. You know, and said it was too much, momentum is too, you know, this is impossible, you know, and they've come around. Um, but, um, but, you know, he's got tremendous support. The Scottish National Party, uh, Sinn Féin in uh, Ireland. I mean, these are the parties that actually have substantial support, and they integrate feminist concerns and women um, in their leadership. I mean, the new leader of Sinn Féin is a woman. She succeeded, you know, um, Jerry uh, Adams. Um, I mean, she's a pretty cool woman, too. Uh, so, you know, some of these parties um, are really very, very interesting. Um, so, you know, we just have to wait and see. So, but my only issue is that the World Social Forum doesn't believe in having any kind <laughs> of formal ties, you know, with political parties. But I think that at some point, you know, they've just got to change that charter and let's be a little bit more coordinated and let's see if um, we can really move forward and, and change some folks. Our world is really not looking good, you know. And, you know, we were talking last night about how, um, uh, you know, I mean, I've been doing the scholarship and also doing activism for a very long time. I mean, you know, I'm a... Uh, Iranian Revolution, we were all so excited about it, and so on and so forth. Um, 
But, um, you know, and I've seen all these new democratic transitions in the 1980s, and, you know, I was marching for, you know, Latin America, for South Korea, you know, Central America, and so on and so forth. Um, but then, you know, when it comes to the post-2011 era, and, you know, one becomes really very, very discouraged, especially when you see the region that I'm from, the Middle East, just torn apart, you know. Um, I mean, it was never like that before, you know. One conflict after another, this incredible wave of refugees, um, arms going to Saudi Arabia from the U.S. and the U.K., um, you know, and Saudi Arabia bombing, you know, Yemen. Um, and who's, uh, who's protesting this? Code Pink. <laughs> Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. A bunch of other feminist um, organizations, some other, you know, peace organizations, some, you know, um, uh, you know, left group, but none of the mainstream parties. And that's why a lot of folks have moved away from those mainstream parties. A lot of folks on the left have moved away from those uh, mainstream parties. And some of them, unfortunately, have moved towards the right um, for some of these new, you know, populist parties that have come on board. I mean, if you remember, you know, what was Trump telling us in, in his campaign? He's going to get us out of those Middle Eastern wars. And he's going to engage in infrastructural um, development and upgrading, and God knows we need that here, you know, with these power lines that fall apart every time there's some snow and rain, and you know, our railroads are antediluvian, and I wish the Chinese would come in and give us some brand new um, the rail, rail trains and stuff. Um, but, you know, that hasn't happened, you know. So even his economic nationalism, you know, has dissipated, and he's just become more of the same. It's just, you know, the more mainstream stuff. Um, but in these other countries, in Poland and Hungary and stuff, you know, some of their policies are the kinds of policies that, um, you know, leftists were talking about. I mean, in Poland, Poland was never a welfare state. Well, it was during communism. Well, uh, where's Joe? Yeah. So, Joe. So, you've probably heard about the new family um, and child allowance. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, that's what they're doing to recruit people to their, uh, you know, to their side. Um, and this is what, uh, what left-wing and, you know, progressive parties should be doing at governments. Um, but, uh, but the previous government of Poland didn't do that. But it was the right-wing government that introduced these uh, types of uh, welfare policies. Welfare under a right-wing, populist, nationalist, Polish, you know, this Kaczynski, how do you pronounce his name? Um, so, uh, and then Orban is coming up with the same idea of having these child allowances, um, you know, for uh, any number of children that you have. And they're pretty generous, too. So, you know, building a welfare state under right-wing conditions, <laughs> you know, that's, uh... so we should be doing that. Um, that those are the sorts of arguments and such that the progressive parties, well, have been making, but should be able to make. And because the mainstream parties have not been making those, they've moved away from it, um, then uh, it, uh, the discourse and the policy uh, domain has been appropriated by the, uh, the right. So we've got to get our act together, basically, uh, you know, uh, what I'm saying. So valorization also of the work that women and mothers do becomes really very important. That's why I say that, you know, that we should not be ceding, you know, um, motherhood or even religious values to the right. You know, we need to be reaching out and bringing them <laughs> to, uh, you know, to our side rather than, you know, let them be recruited by, by the right. And there are ways of doing that that does not um, invalidate or does not undermine the integrity of a progressive agenda. Yeah, I just wanted to ask about like what methods you would propose to like maybe bring in people from like more religious backgrounds or any like non you know traditionally like leftist backgrounds into like the leftist sphere? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll first give you the example of um, Islamic feminism. 
um, because that was an interesting bridge building um, you know, experience and initiative. Um, you know, after the Iranian Revolution, those of us who came from the left and were secular, etc., um, had this huge ideological gulf with the, you know, Khomeini babes, you know, the one, <laughs> the, 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 not that gal, but, you know, the ones with uh, the black chadors and such. Um, I mean, there was incredible amount of mutual animosity, antipathy, and hostility. We didn't talk to each other, of course. Not at all during the 1980s. Um, but in the early 1990s, something new emerged in Iran, which was called Islamic feminism. This was a new reinterpretation of the Quran and of early um, Islamic history in a more egalitarian um, direction. In other words, these Islamic feminists, I mean, that was the term that we gave them. <laughs> um, these, but later on, they, uh, they accepted the, the label. Um, they argued that um, the genuinely emancipatory <laughs> content uh, or spirit or message of Islam had been hijacked by these conservative patriarchal jurists in the Middle Ages when the schools of jurisprudence of Islam were being uh, you know, finalized, and also in more modern years when family laws were being constructed and so on and so forth. And that it was their role and their responsibility to go back to the egalitarian spirit of Islam. Um, actually, it did the trick. It, it was really very interesting about how they, this message actually resonated with so many Iranian women. Now, on the left and the secularists, there was a lot of debate. So I have this article that came out in Signs in 2003 or something, where I describe all of this. And um, among the, the secular feminist left, there was a lot of contention over whether this was something that we should be supporting or not. I actually supported it. But what happens is that um, in an Islamic state, that kind of discourse and initiative does hit its limits at some point. Because the Islamic State and its spokespersons will eventually come out and say that, you know, shut up, you know, we know Islam better than you do. And anyway, we're the ones who are, uh, you know, the decision makers here and so on. But those Islamic feminists did manage two very important <coughs> things. One was that they did help change or amend some laws, like the divorce law um, and, uh, and child custody laws. So allowing mothers to have custody of their children after, uh, after a divorce. But the other thing they managed to do, and also to raise the age of marriage <laughs> from puberty. <laughs> um, they, you know, they wanted it to be 15, but you know, um, uh, the, the parliament would only go until 13. But actually, the actual age of first marriage in Iran is actually 24, 25 for, for young women. Uh, but the other thing they did is they actually recruited and appealed to so many of these veiled women. So a lot of Iranian veiled women, those Khomeini babes, those incredibly ideological women of the 1980s, changed their perspective. Now, they changed their perspective also because of, you know, years of public schooling and going to university and, you know, this kind of thing as well. But they changed their perspective because of the arguments, because of these books and these articles and these magazines and these newspapers that were being published by these Islamic feminists. You know, most people who are knowledgeable of Iran would argue that Iran now has the most secular society, society of the Middle East. Thank you. So that was, you know, so can that happen in America? You know, can you? I mean, for example, last year in that, you know, wonderful, you know, the Women's March, you know, when they told the self-defined anti-abortion feminists that they couldn't take part, was that a smart strategic move? Well, that was, you know, I mean, who is going to build a bridge with, you know, with these religious women? Well, I'm afraid we uh, are going to have to uh, stop for today, but I think, I'm sure Professor Mogadam would be happy to, to continue the conversation uh, a little bit, so if any of you have questions that you didn't get a chance to ask. Um, we will be continuing our Center for Historical Research series.
with a, another talk involving women in revolution, this time the French Revolution. So I hope many of you will come back and join us on March 2nd when Suzanne Dassan of the University of Wisconsin will talk about the October days in the French Revolution, which is a women's movement uh, that radicalized uh, the French Revolution quite a bit. Thanks very much to Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies for co-sponsoring this visit. And thank you very much again to Professor Bogdan for a great and uh, very thoughtful book talk.